Hi guys, welcome back. The X79 chipset was released back in late 2011 as the continuation of Intel's HEDT line. Taking over from its predecessor, the X58, Intel introduced significant performance and feature upgrades such as PCI Express Gen 3 support, USB 3.0, integrated North Bridge, and also a native SATA 3 controller. The rather huge socket LGA 2011 first supported 32 nanometer Sandy Bridge E processors, and some two years later, also the refined 22 nanometer Ivy Bridge E processors. X79 platform initially launched with just the six core parts, the 550 USD i7 3930K and the Extreme, the $1,000 i7-3960X. The moderately priced but locked quad-core i7-3820 was not far behind, launching in Q1 2012 for around 300 USD. With the platform's overall massive price tag and huge popularity of the regular Sandy Bridge lineup, did X79 even stand a chance? Well, let's put it to the test. I got my hands on the cheapest i7-3820 and the mid-range 3930K to cover both ends. I will be using Gigabyte's X79 UD3 motherboard with his latest F20 BIOS, 4 sticks of Kingston HyperX Beast DDR3 memory which is running at 2400 MHz and the latest 21H2 Windows 10 running on a 500GB SATA SSD. Cooling was first handled by Hyper212 EVO but things got out of control quickly so a Corsair H100i GTX had to take over in the end. Intel locked 3820's core multiplier, however, this gigabyte board comes with a non-K overclock feature and allows to set the multiplier to up to 43, resulting in 4.3 GHz overclock without the need of touching the base clock frequency. Then, I set the XMP profile for the memory and disable all power saving features to help stabilize the overclocking. With this out of the way, let's first establish the baseline performance of the 3820. In CPU-Z, the 3820 pushed a single thread score of 366. This roughly matches 2500K's performance, but is well ahead of the older i7-960. At 4.3 GHz, the single core increased by 12% to 412 points, following nearly a 1 to 1 ratio with processor frequency. And finally, adding just a mild base clock adjustment to push the CPU to 4.5 GHz, the score increased to 443. This was an impressive 21% increase over the stock and to no one's surprise, about as much as I got out of the 2500K which was running at 4.7 GHz. Let's swap over to 6 core 3930K and jump straight to 4.3 GHz, at which point it did not require any voltage adjustment. At 4.3 GHz it pushed 428 points and finally at 4.5 GHz chart topping 449 points. Now let's take a closer look at multi-thread capability of both CPUs in Cinebench R20. The quad-core 3820 at stock speed scored 1364 points which was touch faster than fully overclocked 2500K and faster than the much newer FX8320E. When overclocked to 4.5GHz, I saw 21% increase to 1651. Adding two extra cores by swapping to 3930K really pushed the boundaries. At 4.5GHz, the multi-thread score jumped to 2414 points. Very impressive. Or is it? It goes without saying, I do enjoy messing about with all the hardware. This is my hobby and reason why I stay up until 1am just to make sure I got that extra 100MHz in. Doing YouTube is not a business to me, but the countless hour of my spare time could be spent elsewhere, for example playing games. So if you enjoy this kind of content, please hit the like button and consider subscribing. Before we move on to game benchmarks, a word about Silicon Lottery. No, not the now closed website that was selling binned chips, but my unfortunate luck with the purchase of the 3930K. Reading up all the Reddit posts and even written articles would suggest that many were able to achieve 4.6 or even 4.8 GHz without too much sweat. I only just about achieved a stable 4.5 GHz and I had to increase core voltage to a staggering 1.45 volts. At first, I would not admit to the poor capability of my CPU, but after a couple of hours of testing, I realized I just got very unlucky. More volts means more heat 
and so much so in fact, that the poor Hyper 212 EVO had to be ditched for a 240mm all-in-one liquid cooler, the Corsair H100i GTX. To maintain the period correct theme for game testing, I decided to use GTX 780, hopefully highlighting the CPU bottleneck, and as ever, to reverse this, I used the Big Chungus Gigabyte Aorus RTX 3080. Let's first compare stock versus mildly overclocked 3820 in Shadow of Tomb Raider at 1080p. This made very little difference, at 4.3GHz I saw less than 1 frame per second increase. Please note, I've rerun the test multiple times and then calculated the averages. Adding 2 extra cores but still at 4.3GHz pushed the average only slightly up to 37fps, whilst the power consumption went up by 30W on average. Although I was able to push 3820 to 4.5GHz, 4 I could not get the Shadow of Tomb Raider to run and bizarrely, the motherboard lost the network adapter. Finally at 4.5GHz, the 3930K pushed 37.8fps average, again a very mild increase. Only when I introduced the RTX 3080, this test put some serious strain on the CPU and power consumption jumped to around 140 watts, and then I saw 130fps on average. Let's try Cyberpunk 2077 next, using the built-in benchmark at 1080p and with low preset. The 500MHz overclock did not bring noticeable difference, and at just 0.2 of a frame you can call it margin of error. With both CPUs at 4.5GHz, the difference was less than a half a frame per second. Part of me was hoping to see bigger improvement, but we are of course GPU bound. Adding 3080 into the mix and I saw 113 FPS on average and the CPU was pulling around 130 watts. The RTX was only utilized to about 55% on average, far from being pushed. This nicely highlights just how important it is to match your PC component. Up next was Forza Horizon 4 and its built-in benchmark with Ultra Preset. I tested both 1080 and 1440p. I observed a nice 125fps bottleneck on both resolutions with the 3080. The poor GTX 780 at around 35fps on average and just below 30 at 1440p. However, a quick but important note on this. One can really enjoy Forza at 60 plus FPS, just needs to drop the graphics preset to medium. 2019's Remnant from the Ashes is one of my favourite titles, especially the later boss fights. At ultra settings, even the GTX 780 punched 53 FPS on average. The 3080 was held back by the CPU and pushed slightly higher average of 122 at 1440p. Doom Eternal was next. With just 3GB of VRAM off the 780, the engine only allowed low preset. The rather unplayable 34fps on average and 1080p meant that this game was simply too much. Games spring back to his life with RTX 3080 and even an ultra nightmare preset, I saw 300 plus FPS on average. Can I just say I appreciate the naming convention? Back in Cyberpunk 2077, this time cruising through the city, where the 3930K and GTX 780 combo plane simply isn't strong enough. With just 25 FPS on average at 1080p, the only option left is to drop the resolution down to 720p. Have a RTX 3080 at your disposal? Well, you'll be pleased to hear that even with ultra preset with no DLSS, I still saw 81 FPS on average. Bit of Subnautica is just what I needed after I realized all of my gameplay footage was recorded with wrong CPU label in Afterburner. A big oof. Anyway, with maxed out settings at 1080p, even the GTX 780 pushed a nice 57 FPS average. With RTX 3080, the game hit 142 FPS bottleneck at both 1080p and at 1440p. Do you guys play this game at all? Another Vulcan game I tested was Red Dead Redemption 2. With last tick of favor performance and low textures, the GTX 780 managed 36 FPS on average, which was borderline playable and not how the game should be enjoyed. Swapping to 3080 and with maxed out settings and no DLSS, I still saw 97 FPS on average at 1080p and 85 at 1440p. Closing of game testing with some Fortnite for a good measure. 
With the DX11 high preset, I saw a respectable 70 FPS average when using the GTX 780 at 1080p. 3080 with the Epic preset pushed 127 FPS average, but rather poor 1% lows. A very similar story at 1440p. Done. Ok, let's break it down a little. Based purely on my terrible experience with my particular setup in 2022, I'm happy to bin this platform, it's done. Outdated, too expensive and very power hungry. How did Intel think it's ok to charge a premium for a locked quad core? I say that because here's the invoice for my i7-2700K which I purchased back in 2012. Why? Breeze the overclock, having the multiplier unlocked at fraction of the cost and it stayed rock solid for many years to come. Now, taking a step back from my experience and after watching many reviews, I will admit the X79 was awesome, but there is one caveat, and that is the Ivy Bridge E. To put it simply, X79 only made sense nearly two years after its launch. These chips made all the difference. PCI Express 3.0 for your shiny new GPU? Well, it's not there with my 3930K, I'm afraid. After spending a few weeks testing with this hardware, it is clear to me that I owe myself the sweeter half of the X79, which means in future I will revisit and make a follow-up video using one of the Ivy Bridge E CPUs. Lastly, speaking of the future, 2023 only started and with the recent success of the R9 295X2 video, I had to think twice about what comes out next. You guys might not know, but the pressure is on. I'm going to change the format of my video slightly, hopefully pleasing both visually and also by using more sensible testing methods. I was even unsure if to release this X79 video, but if you're watching this, I guess it's out. Going back to January 2022, my humble subscriber count was at 33. It means a lot to me to see the numbers grow, it's fun reading your comments and mostly, I feel great sharing my passion with you. For that, I'd like to thank you and hope to see you all in the next one.